Aaron, thanks. Good evening, everyone. We begin our special coverage of the death of Whitney Houston tonight with new developments. A source giving CNN the latest on toxicology testing, saying investigators have put a rush on it. Also telling us that all the pills and medicine bottles found in her hotel room are undergoing basic testing right now. At this point, the source tells us no determination has been made about the contents, but so far nothing appears criminal. This means we may get results sooner than the six to eight weeks, some had said even just days ago. That same source is downplaying as speculation reports that family members have been told that a drug and alcohol combination led to Houston's death. Fact is, we simply won't know until complete toxicology reports come in. As I said, that may now happen sooner rather than later. We're also learning more about who will be speaking and singing at the funeral on Saturday, and we'll have a live report from outside the church shortly with more on that. We confirmed that her ex-husband, Bobby Brown, will be attending, but also that he plans to perform just a few hours later at a casino in Connecticut. Dr. Drew Pinsky joins us shortly with more on the possible drug angle, also Houston's former voice coach. But first, Jason Carroll outside the New Hope Baptist Church in Newark, New Jersey, with more late details. Jason, I understand there's some new information about who's going to be at the funeral on Saturday. What, what do you know? Well, I can tell you a little earlier, Anderson, I spoke to a woman by the name of Kim Burrell. Now, that name may not be familiar to some people, but to those in the gospel community, it is, it is a person who is very well known. She was friends with Whitney Houston for, for 13 years. Uh, they were extremely close, and she told me that she will be performing at their funeral on Saturday. The song is going to be called, I Believe in You and Me. It was a song that Whitney loved. It was chosen by her family. And I asked Kim Burrell what will be in her mind when she, when she sings that song on Saturday. I feel um, strong because I have to represent what I know she would want me to say and feel and make the people there feel. Uh, Whitney was a caring and loving person. And in that regard, I'll make sure that my delivery will be some form of strength especially with her daughter there and her mother there. And we all share a very special relationship, and I want to make sure that I'm strong enough to build them up as well. Some of the other names that uh, we'll be hearing about on Saturday, Alicia Keys uh, confirmed uh, late this evening that she will be performing Anderson, uh, as well as people like Aretha Franklin. CV Wonder will be performing as well. Kevin Costner, her co-star from The Bodyguard, he will be speaking uh, at the funeral service on Saturday. In addition to that, Roberta Flack will be showing up. A long list of entertainers who will be coming out to pay their respects. And Anderson? As we mentioned earlier, Bobby Brown will be there. Uh, there had been some reports earlier that, that he actually Actually, have been asked not to attend. Clearly, that's not the case. True. Uh, what we are hearing from Bobby Brown's people is that uh, he will be here. You know, obviously there were some early reports because of the tumultuous relationship that he shared with it in Houston. Whether or not he will be here, he will be here. Uh, he will be attending. Uh, but as you also know, um, he's a member of the uh, group uh, New Edition. They are out on tour. And uh, what we are hearing is that after he attends the funeral service here on Saturday, he'll actually go back out on stage uh, Saturday night. And the reason for that is because, according to a spokesperson, being on stage, Anderson, is how he finds, uh, deals, it's his version of therapy and how he's dealing with this significant loss in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the scene like outside the church? I mean, are there people there? I remember uh when when her body was brought back the crowds had gathered are, are people already there or is it not not yet Anderson had been coming and going all day long and, and into, into the night. It, it's, it's been very sad. I mean, as you stand here in front of the church, you can hear echoes of the church choir practicing. You can people driving by, rolling down their windows, uh, playing Whitney Houston songs. And here at the New Hope Baptist Church, people are still bringing by cards and, and letters. And you know, this is really the time to do it because, as you know, because of security, uh, when the uh, funeral happens here on Saturday, they'll be the closest anyone from the public will be able to come here is two blocks away. So people are really using this time now to come down and pay their respects. Uh, Jason, I appreciate the, uh, the update. Thanks. Among the many remarkable talents who will be singing on Saturday, two have spoken out about the strain that Whitney Houston was under, no longer able to perform the way she once could. Aretha Franklin tells People Magazine, quote, I recall her 2010 European tour, still exciting, but she adds, unable to sing what she wanted to, had to be disheartening, and yet she stood night after night and endured unappreciative audiences with the heart of a champion. Kim Burrell, who uh, you just uh, heard from a moment ago, remembers that tour, remembers the call for help. 
one of the main reasons I went to Germany was because of all of the energy that people and their opinions of her voice and her life and her her, her stardom and uh, was starting to get to her. Everybody has an opinion. With a life that big, you're going to get a lot of opinions. And, and some of them were just way too forward in that territory. And so she put a call in to me and said, Sis, I think I need you out here for a few days just to come and pray with me and be with me. I said, sure. Joining me now is Gary Katona, who is Whitney Houston's vocal coach off and on since 2004, was planning on working with her um, this year. I, I understand you met uh, Whitney Houston back in 2004 after being introduced by Stevie Wonder and, and began working with her. What kind of a shape was her voice in back then? Uh, when I went to see her in Atlanta, her voice was in a horrible condition. I mean, her speaking voice and her singing voice were both hoarse. She had about one audible tone in her lower register. I was, I was horrified. You know, I had this image of her being a young, beautiful lady with this incredible voice. And here she is sitting in front of me with no voice whatsoever. And how does that happen? I mean, obviously her, her battles with drugs were, were, were very public. Is, is it from that? Well, when you think about it, Anderson, you, you know, if you're a singer, your body is your instrument and you have to take care of it. And uh, whatever lifestyle choices she made obviously had a negative effect on her voice. Were there actual, were there, I mean, I just interviewed Adele who had a, uh, you know, a, a polyp in her throat that had hemorrhage. It, was, it, was there actual structural issues or was it just a toll that abuse had taken? Well, I think that it was generally abused, but, you know, her voice began recovering very quickly from, from vocal exercising. So that told me a great deal. A lot of her injury was, was superficial or else her voice would not have returned as quickly as it did. And every lesson that we had, her voice got better and better and better each time. For, for an artist known for her voice as the voice, I mean, to not be able to, to use that instrument in the way that she once could, what was that like for her? You have to realize, Anderson, a singer is a very special kind of musician. You know, you are your voice. It's a part of your personality. It's a part of your emotions. It's a part of your spirituality. And to have that taken away from you is a very profound psychological experience. In her case, she was aware of who she was. She was a, one of the most brilliant singers of all time, and she knew that. And she knew that she was carrying a tradition on her shoulder. And not having that voice at her disposal, I think it wreaked havoc on her psychologically. I heard you say that, that she valued that voice above everything else, about fame, about mo above money. That's correct. She was a pure artist. She wasn't an entertainer. Like other people, she was an artist. Her, her, her life is based upon her voice. Um, she had a remarkable voice. It, it could do anything. It could sing with, with incredible excitement. It could be very beautiful and very seductive. She had, she had the whole thing. At a very high level of emotional content as well. She was her voice. And without her voice, she, had, she did not have much of a life. We heard, um, you know, the, the kind of the impromptu final performance that she gave on, on Thursday night, just singing a, a few lines from a, from a gospel song with a friend of hers on a stage. Um, when, when you heard that, I mean, could, could her voice have come back? I'm very confident after working with her over the course of a couple of years, maybe, maybe four or five years, that her voice could have come back. I got a voice back her probably 75% by the time she did her record. And that's not, with, not, not without working with her on a daily basis. Uh, if I had been with her for three or four months in a row, I think I could have gotten 95% of her voice back. What was your impression of the folks she surrounded herself with? You know, what was your from your vantage point inside when you worked with her? Well, the problem is that she was a very powerful person, very charismatic, very, very confident. She was a, an alpha female, and she was more powerful than people that were, were around her, so it was made it very difficult for people to control her. She was smart, she's beautiful, and she's brilliantly uh, gifted. So how do you control somebody like that? Everybody around her had very good intentions. They wanted her to get better, they wanted her to sing again, but they only can go so far because she was a very domineering personality. With me, it was different because I was her teacher, and she, and she was able to, to put her ego aside and to become a real student when we were together, um, giving her voice lessons. But with other folks, if she wanted something, she wanted it, other, they didn't have the power to stop her. That's correct. It, it was virtually impossible to stop her. She was a very, very aggressive, powerful person, a, a lovely person, a very warm, and affectionate, and caring person. But at the same time, she was very demanding. And if you didn't do what she wanted, she got very upset. Um, I mean, it's, it's such a loss, and, and you know that uh, better than anyone from, from having worked yeah. with her voice. Gary, I appreciate you being on tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, uh, let us know what you think. Uh, we're on Facebook, Google+, add us to your circles. You can follow me on Twitter, at Anderson Cooper. I'm tweeting tonight.
as our special coverage continues in the death of Whitney Houston. Up next, we'll talk to Dr. Drew Pinsky about the psychological effects that a talent like hers experiences when that talent, when that voice begins to fade. Also, more on the dangers of mixing drugs and alcohol, especially the kind of anti-anxiety drug Houston reportedly uh, was taken, that at least was found in her room, that frankly, a lot of Americans take. We will find out more about it. Later, a remarkable trip back to Whitney Houston's childhood, to the neighborhood that nurtured her, watched her shine, and has tears in its eyes tonight. Well, as much as everybody wants to remember Whitney Houston for just her incredible voice, the, the life she led sadly makes that very difficult, if not impossible. Investigators, as we speak, are screening her blood, testing her pill bottles, and questioning her doctors and pharmacists. They put a rush on it, according to one source CNN believes to be reliable. With that as the backdrop, we're joined again once, once again by addiction specialist Dr. Drew Pinsky, host of Dr. Drew on HLN. So we heard earlier from, from Whitney Houston's voice coach just a minute ago about how important music was to her and, and how basically her lifestyle choices had led to the condition of her voice when, when he first started working with her. She was a smoker. Clearly, she battled drugs for many years. Why would a talent you know, who depends on a voice, allow that one instrument to be damaged in that way. Well, I, there, there's a couple things I want to say about that interview. One is that the fact that you would even call what Whitney was doing a lifestyle, lifestyle choice belies a grave misunderstanding about what was going on with Whitney Houston. Whitney Houston had addiction. And that's not addiction a choice. Addiction is not a choice. It's not a choice. It, if they had choice, believe me, they would choose not to use the drugs. But they lose their choice once they throw the switch on that disease. The other thing, he was describing how powerful she was. That is Whitney the using addict. Not just powerful, grandiose, aggressive, demanding. That's how addicts are. That's how addicts get their way. That's why people around addicts have such difficulty getting to contain them. If you look at the 2009 interview, the Oprah interview that Whitney did, there you see the sober Whitney who is quiet and lovely and the gorgeous woman we all have come to expect. But when using, you see all these stories of this terrible behavior. And unfortunately, when you have someone like that, everybody must be unified in getting them the treatment. There must be an absolute show of force at all time. Any crack in that wall, they will get through and continue to use. But, you know, I think there are a lot of people out there who, who when you when hear, hear you say that an addict doesn't have a choice, is going to say, well, look, there is personal responsibility. And, you know, some some people are able to stop. And doesn't the fact that some addicts are able to stop show that it is a matter of willpower or control? What, what, well, what they are able to stop, they're able to, to follow directions in treatment. And what they are taught is that willpower will not help you. Your will is broken in this disease. The drives easily overwhelm will. They hurt their family. They hurt their jobs. They hurt their voice in this case. Of course they would choose not to do this if they had choice. And this is a brain disorder where choice is no longer operating. That's the nature of the condition. Now, it's a spectrum disease. In milder cases, when people are earlier in the disease, sure, choice enters into it. People stop and start. But once they become chronic, have had multiple treatments, that's a situation where they can only choose one thing, which is treatment, and in treatment choose abstinence. Otherwise, they really do lose their choices. A, a source has told CNN that Xanax was found in Whitney Houston's hotel room. Investigators don't know if she'd taken the medication on the day she died at this point. We don't have the toxicology reports. We talked a lot yesterday about how dangerous it is to mix a legal prescription drug, uh, something like a sleeping pill, like Ambien, perhaps with alcohol. Um, but Xanax is so widely prescribed, so widely used, what sort of risks are associated with that? Well, the, uh, Xanax, these are excellent medications. You've mentioned Ambien. I believe now Anderson four times you mentioned Ambien. So we'll have to talk after the show about that. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I, and now when, when you travel to other cities, I'm going to be very nervous. Okay. Uh, be sure you don't tip your shard. It's long the plane time. flights. That's when I occasionally will take an Ambien. I, I, I understand. Just avoid the alcohol. Okay. I'm just saying. Um, but that is the issue, is that doctors, of course, warn their patients about not operating vehicles and not to use these things with alcohol, but they forget to really emphasize how potentially dangerous it is, particularly, again, with people with addictive drive. They're just using a little more than they should. They're drinking a little more than they should, and sometimes that combination is enough to really tip things into trouble. When I first heard that this had happened to her, though, the usual combination in my world that leads to demise like this is an opiate, a benzodiazepine, and alcohol. 
So I wouldn't be surprised if we find that that particular. And when, I'm sorry, when you say an opiate in the, in the, and a benzodiazepine, what does that mean? So, so that with the benzodiazepine, you've mentioned the Xanax and the Ambien, and, and I've heard reports of lorazepam and diazepam, Valium being found in her in her hotel room as well. And those are all benzodiazepines. And, and what again, do they do? Those are, all, taking those. those are all anti anxiety, okay. anti anxiety, sleeping, very addictive, not to be exposed to addicts. And certainly that combination, as Sanjay and I talked about last night, never would you give all three of those to anybody in any, any circumstance. So if you're an addict, you should not be on, on some like Xanax because of the possibility opinion, of addiction. Yeah, only, under, only under extreme circumstances and only for very short periods of time. And again, to have all three of those, there's just simply no excuse for that. It's just impossible. That, uh, if, if one doctor prescribed all three of those, I. I don't right. know what to say. But then the opiate and opioid, you asked about that as well, which is the analgesic pain medication, which is, you know, something she has said she had a problem with. I, on that same Oprah interview, she talked right. about that. And that is something that when you're in relapse, you're usually heading towards what your drug of choice is, and opiates are the king of all. Dr. Drew, I uh, appreciate it. Continue to follow it. Thank you. Uh, Whitney Houston's remarkable talent earned her the nickname The Voice. In an interview with Diane Sawyer in 2002, Houston talked about when she realized what her voice could make people feel. Take a look. You know what I used to do, Diane? I would close my eyes. Like this, I'd sing. I was so free and I'd sing. And when I would open my eyes, the people would be what we call Holy Ghost fired out. They would be in such spirit of praise. I think I knew then that it was an infectious thing that God had given me. It was at a young age that that gift was even a parent. Here's a young Whitney Houston singing in church in the 1980s. The same church Whitney Houston is going to uh, come home to on Saturday. The people in Houston's hometown remember a talented young girl, athletic, fun. Gary Tuckman talks to people who knew and loved Whitney Houston as a child. Franklin Elementary School in East Orange, New Jersey, where Whitney Houston went to school from first to fifth grade. Good afternoon, Whitney Houston Academy. Mrs. Patrick speaking. May I help you? But in 1997, it was renamed the Whitney E. Houston Academy of Creative and Performing Arts. The principal is Henry Hamilton, the same man who was principal when Whitney was there as a little girl. Was I proud of her? You better believe it. Yes, I was. This is the enrollment document from Whitney Houston's days at the school. It shows she entered in 1969 and went on to middle school in 1974. In the principal's office, pictures of him with Whitney and lots of other pictures of Whitney after she became famous. She was a beautiful little girl, very quiet, uh, was not a, a talkative person, but she was a well-respected, never came to office for discipline problems, well-behaved. Raymond Shepard used to teach at the school. He reminisces about when Whitney, the niece of Dionne Warwick and the goddaughter of Aretha Franklin, was about to make it big. When she was leaving to go to California to be with Dion Warwick, her aunt, she came to the local store we all used to be in. And the owner, John, said, I'm so glad to see you going. I hope you, I, I wish you the best. And he gave her a hundred dollar bill. And he said, here, this is to help you on your way. The Houston family home was the center of activity in the summertime because it was the only house in the area that had a built-in swimming pool. So young Whitney had a lot of friends who came over. Erica Taylor, the same age as Whitney, was one of those friends. We talk about boys and um, what we did over, what we're doing over the summer, and how it was just fun to be in a pool. And after they would be done swimming in the pool behind the house, they would all watch Whitney hit tennis balls against a wall. How come none of you would play tennis with her? we rather talk to her. We wanted to know, like, we, me and my girlfriend was talking about it the other day, and we were actually asking each other, like, remember when she would play tennis, and we would just ask her, like, how was it to meet Michael Jackson because of her aunt, Dion, and because of... Because of, of Dionne Warwick. Yeah, she, and, you, knew she, and, that, you knew she had celebrity right, connections. Right. But she was just a kid then. But she still had, <laughs> she still knew the people. Her aunt was still Dion. Her, her godmother was Aretha, so she would meet the stars when we were kids. Many who knew Whitney realized her voice was special from her early days singing at church. But some remember her belting out tunes even earlier. The first time I met Whitney, she was, and we called her Nippy back then. She was about five years old. 
Elise Griffith is a retired principal from another East Orange Elementary School, but was a friend who attended a Houston family Christmas party more than 40 years ago. One of the back rooms, Nippy was, had her cousin surrounded by her, and she jumped up on the coffee table and started singing. Back at the Whitney Houston Academy in room 109, one of Whitney's classrooms. Is Whitney Houston your hero? Yes. The pride from current students is unmistakable. With all of her accomplishments, I think I know that I want to be just like her when I grow up. They tell me I'm the father of all the youngsters here, and I take that role. Take that role. So you do consider her a daughter? I consider her a daughter. You better believe it. Daughter forever. A lost daughter. Gary Tuckman, CNN. East Orange, New Jersey. One quick, quick uh, programming note. CNN's going to have complete coverage of the funeral on Saturday. Piers Morgan's told that O'Brien, Don Lemon on CNN and CNN.com. Whitney Houston, her life, her music, starting at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Coming up, once upon